This radio show was pre recorded on Touch 106.1 FM, Boston. We are here once again with Dr. Karen Wingfield, a radiation oncologist, and today we're actually going to talk about finances and how finances affect health. Now, that's an odd sort of way to think about it. Just finances is not something that we would maybe automatically think of when we think about the health of our communities. But why why are finances something that's important? Hmm. Emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, physical well-being, all are directly related to socioeconomic status, abbreviated SES. And if you looked up socioeconomic status and health disparities, you would find it as well. It's just, it's a way for us who write literature to be able to condense our word count. So it's a way to condense three words into one. Thanks for the tip. (laughs) Absolutely. But but that's why we're having these discussions, right? So that it, you know, it's very important to make sure that we in our community are really literate and understand the different acronyms that are used. There are lots of different abbreviations. So that's a great question. I think it's important for all of us. And certainly, you know, you can read something on somebody's website, and if you saw SES and health disparities, you'd be like, okay, I don't know what SES is, and moved on. So hopefully we're learning that we've got to start taking advantage of the fact yes. that we have these great resources in the internet and look up SEA. What does that mean? Or ask people who may know. So that's a really good point. And that feeds into what SES is about, because one of the components of socioeconomic status is education, right? It's a key factor. It's a key factor. Mm. And so what are some of the things, in addition to level of education? So here in Boston, we talked a little bit about the literacy rate. Um, And remember, there are some people who can fake it really well, right? We call those folks functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. So the the level right here in Boston, there are 24% of folks who live in Boston are functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means that they cannot read. They read about maybe on a third grade level. If you handed them an application to fill out for a job, they might not be able to do that. But they can get around. They can take the tea. They can go into a doctor's office and maybe kind of make things out. But the bottom line is they are hampered because of their level of education is not where it needs to be. Now, that's really crucial because most of medicine or just even interacting with a medical community is about paperwork. People are handing you papers. You have to know what's there. Yes. prescriptions. And so I, I, I'm wondering, you know, what you're seeing in terms of how this really just affects us to be functionally literate and to operate in a world that's entirely, almost entirely about words and reading. Yes. And comprehension, mm. right? So if you go into a doctor's office and they're using words that are bigger than what you're used to hearing or seeing, but yet you're too afraid we talked about this, right? We talked about right. the fear that comes along with um, folks who are not used to going to the doctor. Right. And particularly, remember, it's our older black adults, our older Hispanics who may be functionally illiterate. There is certainly a, a gen- younger generation that's coming up that's functionally illiterate because our school systems are passing people yes. through without kind of making sure that they have the basic skills that they need to get yes. along in life. And so this is one of the reasons why level of education is directly, directly correlates with health status. You have got to be able to get the knowledge that you need, whether it be from reading, or people say, I'm not going to the doctor because they're going to hand me a stack of papers and I'm not going to know what to do with it. Mm. Right? Yes. Or they're handed a prescription and they don't know what that prescription says. They don't know how to take their pills. They can't read the bottle. These are things that happen over and over and over again. And guess whose community is affected most? Our communities. Absolutely. Mm. The black community. And even if you look here in in Boston, you look, it's the black and Hispanic communities where have the highest rates of functional illiteracy. Mm. And it's 24% 24 is a high number. And that's functionally illiterate. That has nothing to do with people who may be... Um, have less literacy or who may not have excellent literacy or be able to even work on the same level that you would need to in order to read, say, um, a medical journal. So it's 
critically important, the level of education, it's directly related to health. Mm. One other thing that I think that we need to talk about, too, is income and occupation. Okay. Both of those things are very much related to health because income may be one means by which people can get health insurance, right? That's right. So, or their occupation. So there are some folks who, I know I, my insurance is actually paid for by my job, my employer. It would be extraordinarily expensive for me to have health insurance because my husband is sick. So because he has a pre-existing condition, right. if I had to pay out of pocket to purchase health insurance until we get the new <laughs> Obamacare instituted, right. it would be incredibly expensive for me to do that. It would, it would just not make any sense. I wouldn't be able to, to do it. Um, so there are some folks who do not have health insurance with their job. And so if they have to pay out of pocket, their income is what is going to allow them to be able to purchase a product that would enable them to see a physician. And even then, if you think about it, many of those insurance um, products that they can purchase, even through the Massachusetts, the Connect Care, there's oftentimes fees that are associated. Right. Right. So right. whether it be, you know, you have your monthly fees, but then there's a deductible. Sometimes the deductibles can be up to two thousand or five thousand dollars. A lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money. So if you had to sit there and you're paying two hundred dollars a month to have insurance, and your child gets sick with a cough, what are you going to do? I mean, and you know you have a five thousand dollar deductible. So you're weighing these decisions, you know, in terms of health. So finances again, That's income, occupation absolutely affect health. And that I could see that being a huge barrier to pursuing wellness. If you know that you have to pay the copay, pay $5,000 out of pocket, pay for things that are becoming more and more serious, you don't even want to bother. And so you sort of write it off mm -hmm. um, because you don't want to have to go in and pay that money that you don't have. Yes. Um, so even having health insurance is probably a luxury. In many senses, it is. Um, but even then, I know there were some of my patients who used to be on Medicaid, yes, Medicaid, before the Massachusetts had um, kind of global coverage, and they got switched to a different product. And even though they now had insurance, uh, their health coverage was worse. They found that before, when they were on Medicaid, most of their, their prescriptions were covered. They may have like a $4 copay or it was relatively small. But when they switched to a new insurance product, the copays were so exorbitant for them that there were medications that they had been faithfully taking that they now had to make decisions because they couldn't afford them. So it really is a luxury, but it's, it's hard in the system that we are in today to make sure that the insurance products are actually meeting the needs of our communities. And that's where us mm -hmm. becoming educated about what types of products are available, um, really is very helpful. That's, you know, coupled with not only just knowing what your insurance coverage covers, but that takes that education piece that you were talking about. Knowing actually, yeah. okay, it doesn't cover this medication, these medications anymore. You know, that the finances and education are directly, they must be directly linked to our health. Yes, absolutely. And we talked a little bit last month about this childhood obesity epidemic. Right. So what in the world does finance have to do with that, right? So if we think about where poorer, poorer people live, what communities do they typically live in? Oftentimes, when we live in poor communities, those communities are ridden with all sorts of violence. Yes. Um, we may not feel safe walking in our neighborhoods. We talked about that a little bit as one of the reasons why this obesity epidemic is affecting the black and Hispanics the most is that frequently they are in areas where the children do not feel safe or the parents do not feel their child is safe to go out and play. Mm -hmm. So kids are stuck inside. And you think about what just happened a couple of weeks ago with the Boston Marathon um, incident. Yes. And, you know, first of all, I just want to make sure that um, we are sending out our condolences to all of the victims that were affected by that in their families, because there's a lot of healing that's going to have to happen, both mentally and physically for the folks that were affected. But if you think about how we all felt that Friday 
when yes. we were on lockdown. Yes. We were on lockdown in the city. Yes. But there are children who are on lockdown every single day mm. because their communities don't feel safe. And so those are things that we really have to think about. And why are people living in those communities? Well, because they're either on Section 8 or they get government assistance. They're in government housing. Um, even if you look at where the Boston Housing Association or Boston Housing Authority has different communities in, this, in the city, Charlestown um, is one of them that comes to mind where there's lots of drugs that are up there. Um, people don't want to talk about that, but it's real. And I've mm. interviewed families there one on one, sat down, moms and moms say they are terrified for their son, who may be a teen, a young teen, to be out at, you know, after dark in that neighborhood because they're afraid of violence, whether it be racial violence, which happens and people mm. don't want to talk about that. Racism is alive and well. Mm. And so there's the racism component, but also just being in an environment where there's drugs or you don't want your child to be mistaken for somebody, you know, who's doing something right. wrong just because they have brown skin. Right. Those are things that are real. And the only way that we're going to be able to move out of that situation, move out of those communities, is by having money. Money. Thank you for listening to this segment of Radio Talk with Dr. Karen Wingfield.